Show of hands for Inanna and her descent into the underworld. Okay. Not going to challenge me tonight, thank you. Show of hands for Thor. Sheen Dai. Okay, and a show of hands for Kedredwen and Taliesin. Sheen Dai Tree, Padwepump. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, this is one of my favourite stories. Um, and one of the things that I like about it is that it has so many different... Uh, there's different things you can take from it. You can see it as just sort of on the surface, it's just a sort of a, a chase and a bit of fantasy, or you can look into it for the symbolism and the, the um, you know, teaching and what have you in there. Um, or you can just enjoy it as a piece of our history and our culture. Okay. Um, hands up if you have heard of Keradwen. Okay, hands up if you've heard of Taliesin. Okay, normally the same people, right, there we go. Well, this starts before Taliesin, but after Keredwen came onto the scene. And it's actually a little bit north of here. Do you know Snowdonia? Does anyone know Lake, Lake Bala? Yeah? yeah? Beautiful, beautiful big lake up in the mountains. With the trees. I remember being up there one summer and the sunlight on that water was just divine. It was so peaceful and you just, you can feel the magic there, you can feel the enchantment there. Now a long, long time ago, you've timed that perfectly, <laughs> just starting a new story. No, 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 that was genuine, that wasn't sarcasm. <laughs> so a long, long time ago on the shore of Lake Bala, lived a lady not just any lady but a mother a witch and a wife all three in one not three separate <laughs> all three in one now this lady was Kevin. no no <laughs> Keredwen! Jehovah! Keredwen! Keredwen lived on the shore of the Lake Bala with her two children and her husband. Now, her husband doesn't feature very much in this, so we'll <laughs> set him to one side. The two children, they're quite important. One of them is beautiful, fair haired, very, very, very smart, incredibly sharp little girl. Cryery. The other one was her son. Now they were technically twins, but they were not identical twins. Where she was fair, he was dark. Where she was beautiful, he was ugly. And where she was smart, he was stupid as <clears throat> mud. Poor lad. And of course, being a mother, she loved them both. Of course she did. But her little son, who she'd named Morvran, which means Cormorant, Raven of the Sea, Bran, Mor, Mor, Bran, Morvran. Everyone else called him Avagvi, utter darkness. <laughs> was it? A poor little lad. He hadn't done anything to anyone. Not yet. <laughs> but she loved them both. And while she wasn't worried about her daughter in the slightest, though perhaps she should have been because you don't really hear about her much later on in the stories, she was worried about her son. She wanted to make sure that he could have the best life possible. But she wasn't particularly fussed about the fact that he was ugly or that his hair was dark. I mean, that was fine. You can manage that, that's not a problem. But the smarts. He couldn't even work out how to get through a door half the time. Which worried him. It did worry him. He'd try and push when it said pull and pull when it said push. And I know we've all done that, but he did that a lot. <laughs> so, so, she had a think. And she 
listened to the trees, and she listened to the wind on the lake's surface as it rippled across that beautiful sunlit glow. And she listened to the song of the land and the song of the birds. And she felt the magic in her bones. Because she was an enchantress. She held that magic of the land in her body and in her soul. And some say she went and asked the Druids, but I say she asked the land. Because a Druid, the word for Druid, refers to the oak trees. So it's likely that she spoke to the old wise oaks of the forest. And she wove a spell. She gathered up all of that wisdom and that magic and that knowledge that was deep in her bones and in the sky and in the land and, and she knew exactly what to do. But it was going to take, as is the way of these things, a year and a day. Thirteen whole moon cycles. And it was going to take a great big cauldron. And that cauldron was going to have to be warmed by a fire for an entire year and a day. And into that cauldron was going to have to be put just the right herbs at just the right times. Because the oak only flowers at a certain point in the year and the meadow sweet only blooms at a certain point in the year. And the sorrel grows at a different time to the mistletoe berries. So each ingredient needing to be fresh needed to happen at exactly the right point in that year. And how was she going to go out and gather all of those things to put them into the cauldron and keep the fire lit and keep it stirred so that it wasn't going to burn and make sure that neither her son nor her daughter, because they were both quite small, stuck their hands in the pretty flames. Not a good thing. So, once again, she went and she asked the trees. She walked through the woodland on the shores of Lake Bali, through the trees up those mountains. And she said, what do I do? And then she listened. And as she walked, as the day went by, and she listened, she started to hear something in the distance, a rustling, footsteps. So she kept walking and the footsteps came closer and she kept walking and the footsteps came closer and she could just make out ahead of her on the path two figures. A tall figure hunched, shuffling with a stick and a small figure leading the taller one along. And as she got closer she realised that it was an old blind man and a young lad. And she met them upon the path. And they spoke for a little while and it turned out that they had nowhere to stay. And they'd run out of food. And they were looking for some work. Bed and board. Sounds good. And she went, sounds like the trees have answered me. What are your names? The old man was Morza. And the young boy was Gwion Bach. Little Gwion. She acquired a cauldron, don't ask where from, and plenty of wood. And she set them up in a shack just outside her house. And she made sure they had plenty of food and comfy bedding to sleep in. And Morva stoked up the fire and kept the wood on it. And he could tell from how it felt, whether it was warm enough or growing cold. He could hear from the flickering of the flames what it was doing. So he was perfectly fine to keep the fire going steadily and to bank it up in the evening and to stoke it up in the morning. And little Guillaume Bach was given the biggest spoon you have ever seen to stir this great big cauldron. And he needed a little step to get up on so that he could reach inside it and keep it stirring. 
all day. Luckily, he didn't have to keep it going all night as well. He was allowed to sleep. And he'd stir this big cauldron just up on his tiptoes all day. Occasionally stopping for a sandwich. <coughs> and as the months went by, he got a bit taller and it got a bit easier, but he was still having to stand on his little step. Until the months went by and Keridwen dropped in the herbs at just the right time. The flowers at just the right places, she gathered them and popped them in and little Guion kept stirring. Mother kept stoking the fire and 363 days passed. 364 days passed. See, I can count. 365 <laughs> days passed. And the potion and the cauldron were bubbling nicely and turning just the right gorgeous golden colour. Thick and heavy like honey and sunlight. And the sun dawned and the light streamed in through the door of the shack gently caressed that potion as little Guion stirred and Keridwen came out of her house with her little boy in tow. Now it took a little while to get from the house to the shack, not very long but a little longer than perhaps it should have done because little Morvran wanted to go and play by the water and it took a bit of effort to get him to come along and as the pot was being stirred for those last few minutes Morva shoved a log of wood a little bit deeper into the pile in the fire and it just so happened that that was pine wood still full of pitch, full of tar, full of sap. And it bubbled in the heat of the fire and it bubbled the fire up and the fire flared strangely <coughs> and it sank through the potion and boiled it just a little more than it should have been until a great bubble grew on the top and Guion, as he stirred, noticed it and went, huh, and then it popped. One, two, three drops flew into the air and landed on his thumb. He sucked those three drops from his thumb and in that moment knew that he had consumed the magic that was in that cauldron. He had taken in the magic meant for little Morvran. And he knew in that moment that those three drops contained all of the magic, all of the inspiration, all of the knowledge, the wisdom, the Arwen that was meant for Keridwen's son. And she was going to be pissed. <laughs> oh no. He turned tail and ran as fast as his little legs could carry him. Not quite as little as they'd been when he arrived, but still not very long because he wasn't fully grown. He was still only going on back and he was running as hard as he could. And he knew he was not going to make it off the field before she saw him and sure enough, Keridwen saw the boy run and in that moment she knew exactly what had happened and she gave chase. She didn't even think about it. The fury was so hard that off she ran after him. I'm going to catch that boy and I'm going to give him what to and I'm down. She got closer and closer and closer. As they neared the edge of the field, as they neared the hedgerow, they got closer and closer and closer. And Guion back looked at the hedgerow and went, oh, I'm never going to get through that. I'm never going to get away. She's going to catch me. What do I do? What do I do? And quick as a flash, the Arwen that had sunk into his soul gave him an inspiration, gave him an idea. 
and not only the idea of what, but how. Oh, he leapt into the air and his feet grew large and his ears grew long and his nose grew muzzly and fur sprouted all over him and his little white fluffy tail bobbed behind him as he dove as a hare underneath the hedgerow and across the fields, across the gap between the mountains. But Keretwen had been at this longer than he had and had at least some of the same magic. She transforms, her hands hitting the floor as paws into a great sleek black greyhound with a long muzzle and her pointy ears with just a hint of red at the tip and a tail straight behind her. She dove through the hedgerow, finding the gaps where no human would have and gained upon the hare as he ran. She gained closer and closer, closer and closer until her sharp teeth nipped three hairs from the tip of his fluffy white tail. <laughs> He ran a little faster for a moment, but he knew she was going to catch him. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Then the Arwen struck again and he knew, he knew what he could do. Up ahead there was a river. If he could just make it there, he got closer and closer and closer and he leapt into the air as a hare. And as his paws hit the water, they folded back upon themselves and his nose changed shape and his fur turned to scales and his ears sunk into his body and he became a great salmon swimming upstream as fast as he could. And Keredwen saw this and she, the great sleek greyhound, leapt into the water behind him, her paws becoming webbed, her ears becoming shorter and rounded, her teeth becoming even sharper with a shorter muzzle and a thick, glossy, waterproof coat. And she swam behind him as a great otter. And she got closer and closer through the water. She got closer and closer until her sharp teeth knit three scales from the tip of his tail. <gasps> what do I do? What do I do? She's going to catch me. She's going to catch me. What do I do? What do I do? And then the Arwen struck again, because once it is yours, it is always yours, little Gwion. And he knew, he knew then, he had been across the land. He'd been within the water. The only place he hadn't tried was the sky. As the great salmon, he leapt into the air and he grew tiny, shrinking in upon himself. His fins became feathers and wings and his nose turned into a tiny sharp beak and he grew so small and so round that you could barely see him in the sky as he fluttered his way as high as he could, a tiny little wren, moving its way through the clouds and as high and as high and as high as he could fly. And Keredwen, of course, had seen this. And the great otter spiralled, swirled and leapt up behind him and became a sparrow hawk, riding on the currents, flying closer and closer, closer and closer, closer and closer until her sharp beak nipped. Yes, three tiny feathers from the tiny wren. What do I do? What do I do? There was nowhere else to go. Little Gwion was tired. Little Gwion had not done this amount of magic before. He had not done any magic before. He had not ever moved through the realms in different shapes. He did not know that he had that in him. What do I do? What do I do? The thermals carried his wings just a little higher than the sparrow hawk and gave him a moment of reprise as the clouds parted beneath him and he saw a farm. He saw a farmyard where the wheat had been being thrashed and there were grains all over the ground, scattered and left behind from where they'd been dropped because I don't know about you, but it's a pain trying to pick up all of those tiny, tiny, tiny little things. Have you ever tried to pick up beads if you spilt them on the floor? 
and the inspiration struck. Little Guion tucked his feet up and tucked his wings up and tucked his beak up and trusted to the magic, trusted to the Arwen as he fell like a stone down to the earth and became a tiny seed on the farmyard floor among all the other seeds. His last thought was, she will never find me here. And Keredwen landed in that farmyard, her claws on the floor, her feathers shook. And she shook from the tip of her beak to the tip of her tail and as she did she transformed. You can see it now with that shimmer of magic where she went from being a sleek hunting sparrow hawk to a great black hen. And she began to eat. She ate every single seed on that farmyard floor. Until the entire thing was picked clean and she stood tall, shaking her feathers out into hair. Her beak became her mouth again and her nose, her feathers, clothes. She was glad she'd worn sturdy boots that day. She walked home to her children. But magic being magic had a twist in the tail. So that tiny seed in her belly became a tiny seed in her belly and she discovered that somewhere along the way the magic had shifted things and she was actually pregnant again. Nine months later she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy and she loved him. How could she not? She laid him in his cradle and she forgave him for stealing from her son and she forgave him for the chase and she forgave him for the trouble. But Morvran did not. Morvran by this point was a little bit older and he knew, he knew that that baby had stolen what was meant for him. He might not know what it was but it was meant for him. Every time the two of them were left alone Morvran would look daggers at that little baby and Keratwen knew that it was probably not safe for him to stay. So, in one last act of magic for him, she bundled him up safely in oil skins and spells. She placed him in a coracle and wrapped it tight, and she enchanted it to take him safely away. Safely to a new home. And she placed him into the sea. And off the boat drifted along the coast, just north of here. Along the coast to Abu Dhabi. It was May Eve, the evening of the 30th of April. The sun was setting. And it was said that if you sat on the weir at Abu Dhabi and fished and caught a salmon, your luck would be forever changed for the better. Prince Elvin had heard this story. He had heard this story many, many times because his luck, well, let's just say it wasn't good. He'd been fishing all day and true to form, he had caught 
two old boots and a crab. <laughs> the crab had proceeded to bite his toes, so he'd nudged it back into the water and considered wearing the boots instead, but they were both left feet. <laughs> the sun was setting and he thought, well, it's probably time to go home. And then his hook caught on something. It caught on something heavy and he began to reel it in. He thought, oh, oh, maybe, maybe, no, I better not get my hopes up, but maybe, you never know. You're such an optimist, Elvin, such an optimist. He reeled in the heavy thing, whatever it was, and as it got closer, he realised it was definitely not a salmon. But it did look interesting. He pulled it onto the weir and it was a small coracle wrapped in oil skins. He almost left it and then he thought, well, someone's gone to all this trouble. There's got to be something good in there, right? And as the sun was disappearing and the light was growing dim and he unpeeled the oil skins and he could feel the prickling of magic across his skin but he didn't know what it was and he unwrapped and inside was a baby maybe six months old he wasn't sure he wasn't around babies very much but it, it wasn't very old it was just old enough to open its eyes its bright eyes and look him straight in the face and it stood this baby boy he stood up and help him went that can't be right <laughs> and the baby boy stood and looked him dead in the eyes and said hello Alvin Alvin was speechless this was unusual <laughs> He saw the words and the sunlight glinted just off the edge of the sea and caught the baby's head and caught the magic spark of Arwen that still glowed within and lit it up was behold what a shining brow which is an odd thing to say at the best of times but what would you say when faced with a talking baby a talking baby that could stand no less and the baby said that's a good name for a Welsh shining brow is Taliesin and the baby said Taliesin you have named me and Taliesin I shall be and if you take me to your court if you give me a home I shall grow up to be the greatest bard there ever was. And I will be your bard, Elvin. And your luck will be forever changed. And you know what? He was right. And the tales of Taliesin live on to this day. Hundreds of years later, we still speak his name. We still remember Taliesin as the greatest bard that ever lived. The greatest bard who once was a small boy working hard to stir a pot for a lady by a lake. Now there is one more piece to this story. One more piece that we must remember. More Fran. A Vagli. It is not recorded how it happened, but somehow, somewhere along the way, from between him being this big to being this big, he became a knight of King Arthur's court. And yes, he was still hideous. He was so ugly that the people on the battlefield ran away from him screaming, thinking that he was a demon. And he would fight alongside one of the most beautiful knights in the court that everyone thought was an angel. So it would confuse all of their enemies. Quite a useful tactic. 
but he was also said to be one of the wisest knights at Arthur's table. So Morvran, little Morvran, may not have gotten the Arwen from the cauldron, but he certainly got it some other way. Which just goes to show there's more than one way to find inspiration. If you have enjoyed the stories this evening, then I invite you to share them in whatever way, shape or form you like. Mention them to people, tell them to people, pray see them, try and tell the whole thing. Look them up, just mention the names. Because that is the best way of honouring stories. And that is the best way of honouring the tellers of tales, the great bards like Taliesin, and the spirit of story itself. What is remembered lives, and what is told never dies. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Nostar.